How's it feel to be back in Cambodia, it feels Charlie? Feels great to be home. There's Randy. There's Randy, my man. There's Randy. <laughs> What's up, man? man? Got to take a picture right there, man. What's up, man? Welcome to Cambodia. Before I arrived in Cambodia, a place that's as different as it is distant, I thought I prepared myself by asking questions and researching the problems and circumstances. But nothing could prepare me for what I experienced. Unimaginable kindness, love, and beauty. All growing in and amongst the ruins of a country decimated by genocide only 34 years ago when the Khmer Rouge led by Pol Pot massacred 2 million people. Today, 54% of the country is under the age of 30, and unwanted, malnourished orphans litter the streets, thrown away like garbage. And despite the UN occupation of the 90s, political corruption infests every level of government. But could the problem originate in something less obvious? Cambodia is approximately 96% Buddhist, a religion that teaches people to accept their karma and be content with whatever happens. Because of this mindset, Cambodians rarely make any attempt to make improvements or fight for justice. I came here to visit with a group of Christian missionaries who run an orphan home. The message they bring is the exact opposite of their traditional Khmer attitude. Their work is simple. They provide food, shelter, education, Bibles, and love. By doing this simple job every day, they're enabling a generation of Cambodians to lift themselves up, to reignite their self-worth, and give them a real future worth fighting for. The house is called Water of Life. Consisting of over 2.3 million people, Phnom Penh is the capital and the largest city in Cambodia. New construction projects are everywhere, but nearly all developments are funded and run by foreign investors, leaving the country's fate to the control of outsiders. There are few cities in Cambodia, and so almost all growth and development is centered on Phnom Penh. This is also where NGOs, or non-government development organizations, concentrate their efforts, which are integral to providing relief to the poor. There is a long-standing tradition of bribery, which can get you anything in Cambodia. The heritage of their society, dating back 1,000 years to the Angkor Empire, is built on corruption. Unfortunately, this appears to mean that they can never fully realize a modern society with social justice without the help of outside influences. Our dream is we want to see more men of God here in Cambodia, you know, in the line of the government, you know, and uh, so we can bring the good news, hope to this uh, generation, which is to this nation. Because you know, like about 30 years ago, in uh, Cambodia was in the darkness, like Pol Pot, the Khmer Rouge, some of that, you know, and they teach, and the Khmer Rouge just uh, taught uh, the kids how to kill their parents, how to say that parents are enemy. So and now this generation, we want to teach the boy and kids you know, to grow, to be mature, uh, a man of God, and uh, to lead this country. Cambodia is about 95% Buddhist, and the monks teach passivity and complacency. Their core principle is that contentment is wealth, 
and they discourage all personal aspirations, saying that people's karma is responsible for the good and bad things that happen in life. This has created a severe uphill battle for organizations in Cambodia trying to help increase productivity and improve human rights issues. Water of Life, which started as a small home for boys in 2007, now has over 50 boys and girls living there from ages 14 to 24, and even more who attend their nightly Bible studies. They've also started an offshoot orphanage with a primary school called Children of Hope. They have classes every day in math, English, music, computers, and just about any subject the kids want to learn. As I came here more and more, I really liked Cambodia. I really loved the people so much. And I met a great pastor here, Pastor Seren, and I very much loved him and his family. I just thought, you know, it would make sense that I would live somewhere and get to know the people and know all about them from the inside to the out, and know their way of life. I myself had understood what it was like to be in foster homes as a child, so I had that experience and some, in my mind, uh, experience of wanting love. I asked a friend of mine, Jeff Jackson, uh, what to do? And he said, there's enough of you in America, get out of America. So uh, I did. Various organizations have tried to help Cambodia improve for nearly 200 years. The Vietnamese, Thai, and French all tried to help Cambodia improve their farming as far back as the 1830s, but all of them quit because they thought the Khmer were just too stubborn. It's been proven time and again that top-down initiatives do not work in Cambodia. But this approach, from the bottom up, person to person, may be slow, but it gets results. One time, the street was flooding in front of our old house. And when the streets flood here, you know, of course it comes all the way up and it floods into the house. So when it flooded, all the cockroaches would come up out of the ground. And I looked over and I saw the neighbor lady and her house was much more flooded than ours because we had a four-story house. So we had safety upstairs and everything would dry out. It was all cement. Hers was wood and it was one story and it was all flooded. And she had cockroaches all over her. And at that moment I thought, I want to go back to America. I can't wait to the moment I get to go back to America and not have this all around me. And that thought in my head right then, just like, crucified my own heart. How can I even think that way? How can I think I could leave when they cannot leave? So God really touched my heart again right that moment and said, you go over there and you pick the cockroaches off of her. This is your home too. You said you wanted it to be your home and you have nothing in America anyway, so this is your home too. So we did that. And I'm like, okay, so Lord, I want them to be my people. As long as you have me here, I want to not think like it's those people and us. I want to think that even though I'm white-skinned, I'm old, and I'm <laughs> gray-haired, I want to think like we are one people together, and what they go through, I want to go through with them, and understand their attachment to the Buddhist culture, so that I can help them to understand what Jesus offers them. And I can't explain that to them as well from the outside, but I can explain it better from the inside. To help us understand what the country experienced under Pol Pot and the Khmer Rouge, some of the boys brought us to Tol Slang Prison, also known as S21. It was a school that was converted into a prison where suspects were interrogated under torture before being executed. The first group of people brought there were former members of government, the military and police. Then it was journalists, writers, and artists. Then it was anyone with an education. Even people who wore glasses were suspected of being enemies of the people. And so the Pol Pot came in and said, okay, let's everybody just go to the village, go to the far away, you know? We're gonna help this country to develop very well. And we thought they didn't know, you know? They believed that maybe that's true. And so they just escape and they go to the village and they just call them one, one by one, now call whoever they have educated, you know, and kill them. No, they said, come, we need you, you know, to help the country, you know, but we didn't know. They brought over here, you know, and then you are the educated person, they kill you. And they said the parents are your enemy, you know, that's not your parents, your enemy, and they kill your the parents. 
All three floors in this former school were converted into rows of crude prison cells and torture rooms. These cells, many of which were in near total darkness, measure only three feet by seven feet and were crammed with men, women, and children. The unfortunate people held here would await their interrogations in which they endured unspeakable torture sessions, beatings, and starvation. This would often last for months if the Khmer Rouge interrogators wanted a particular confession. Prisoners brought here would almost certainly be executed. This is a, a murder, murder. It's very like evil, mm -hmm. just like Hitler, no? Mm -hmm. That's what we think about purple today. So the family, the husband and wife, they're not together. They have to separate. And the children have to separate too. Just one in a while, the family, family they can come and visit the, the children. Or maybe the husband can come to visit their wife. Because we might gather like, the, the, all the girls go to other place, and all the guys to other place. And you, if you go to another place, they throw the children badly. All the children and throw to the, 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 the tree. What do they do with babies? They kill the babies. Yeah. You think about what they could have been, um, what was negated because of this senseless uh, slaughter. And that's what breaks my heart the most, to just look at these faces and to imagine that their future could have been so much different and their heritage could have been so much different. That's what breaks my heart the most. I think one of the most uh, destructive legacies of the Khmer Rouge and the Vietnamese occupation was just the destruction of family. And, um, you know, they have a slightly different view of the nuclear family and extended family already, but once that was completely destroyed, you're seeing a lot of, I guess, what some people call post traumatic stress generation who are now parents. And so they don't have, since they didn't grow up in traditional families, they don't have a strong. Uh, model and example for what it means to be a mother and a father to have a good marriage. But a lot of times there's so much disconnect because of Pol Pot, the family environment is broken. So there, it's so easy to just let go of their kid. It's really sad. Pol Pot took away their ability to dream. Pol Pot had an idea that he could take us, as if possible, a chip out of their brain and make them people without a dream, without hope. So he made them an agrarian people, an agrarian society, and he managed to do that to a whole generation of people by making the young boy kill his young sister or kill his own mother. So or making the husband kill the wife or the wife kill the husband. So Pol Pot was able to take away from them this ability to love and to dream for the future. So most Cambodians just believe all they can ever be is a rice farmer. So when you tell them you can grab a star, they say, no, we cannot. All we can ever do is rice farm. The man responsible for overseeing Tol Slang prison was known as Comrade Doik. After the fall of the Khmer Rouge in 1979, he fled to the Thai border to reunite with his family. He changed his name and became a math teacher, moving between several schools. One day in 1995, he attended a prayer meeting at Golden West Cambodian Christian Church. Doik was later baptized and stated to his church family, I don't know if my brothers and sisters can forgive the sins I've committed against the people. In 1997, a joint tribunal was founded in conjunction with the United Nations. Its purpose was to try the remaining leaders of the Khmer Rouge for war crimes. In 1999, while working with the Christian relief agency World Vision, Doig granted an interview with a reporter from a foreign newspaper who had identified him as the former Khmer Rouge officer. After the interview was published, he was tracked down by police, arrested, and put on trial for war crimes. He was later sentenced to life in prison. While on a visit to Tolslang Prison in 2008 as part of his trial, he reportedly collapsed in tears while pleading, I ask for your forgiveness. I know that you cannot forgive me, but I ask that you leave me the hope that you might. To this day, he is the only member put on trial to admit what he had done and ask for forgiveness. When a prisoner's interrogation was completed, they were transferred by truck to a location 15 kilometers outside of the city known as the Killing Field. Today the site is memorialized and has been named the Chong Ek Genocidal Center. There are over 300 known killing fields and mass graves in Cambodia, containing about one million bodies. But this is the most widely known location. There are almost 9,000 bodies buried here, comprised of mostly political prisoners. 
Visitors can see victims' clothing and bones still surfacing through the dirt due to erosion. Five thousand skulls have been excavated and collected into the memorial stupa at the center, where people can pay their respects. You're passing signs. Mm -hmm. You know, this is where the trucks dropped off the people. That's right. I remember that. You know, you're seeing signs as you walk along. This tree was used, the soldiers used to kill babies against this tree. That's right. And you can see uh, bones just showing from the ground and some clothing. And I actually had tears in my eyes when I saw that. You know, I went back to where that, there was a gingham shirt. Mm. That was, that was someone. You're in this beautiful landscape. Mm. Everything's green and, and yet, blossoming. And you can't, I can't imagine it. You can't really conceive what, what happened. Everything I saw, clothes, bones of babies, when I saw that, I just wanted to leave the place. It started me thinking like, the guy driving my tuk-tuk or the person who made my coffee, mm. you know, who's of a certain age, Mm -hmm. Were they part of the Khmer Rouge mm -hmm. or, not or, I mean, if everybody lost mm -hmm. family, who, who did they lose? After four devastating years, the Khmer Rouge relinquished control of Phnom Penh in 1979 after they were defeated by the invading Vietnamese. Pol Pot and his cadre retreated westward and retained control of the jungles where they profited for years off gem mining and rare timber. Pol Pot finally dissolved the Khmer Rouge in 1996. He died a free man two years later, never having faced trial. When violence finally ceased and relative stability was restored, Cambodians returned to their villages and began rebuilding their lives. What followed was a baby boom. Cambodians typically have large families, even in the poorest regions. But now that many of the older people and almost all of the educated had died during a decade of violence, all that was left was a country comprised of mostly the young and the uneducated. 54% of the country is under the age of 25, which makes the median age only 23.3. Since nearly one quarter of adults are completely illiterate, the vast majority of these young people do not have the employable skills that are needed to grow an economy. Add all of these facts together, and what you get is an ever-growing number of orphans. There is an estimated 630,000 orphans in Cambodia. That's 10% of all children. For the purposes of comparison, approximately 2.5% of children are orphans in the United States. We were helping an orphanage down the street here, and we've been helping them for about four years. And uh, the, the leaders of the orphanage were doing uh, uh, incorrect things to the children. So uh, Catherine became alarmed about it, and she was, her heart was breaking over seeing the things going on. And I was getting very upset at the leadership because they were doing terrible things to the children. So one day we saw all the children walking down the street with their knapsacks, everything they owned. And we were walking down there and we asked them what they're doing. They said, we, we got thrown out, we have no home anymore. So we're all leaving. And I said, where are you going? And they said, we don't know, but we all have to leave. And they, we just saw them right in front of our house here. At that moment, then Catherine and I looked at each other and we knew what we had to do. I run a children's home here and I have 32 kids. Right now, currently, it's about 15 to 2,000 who run a house of 32 children. 2,000 is housing, their food, that's doctor bills, stuff like that. Most kids that are running the streets are living on the streets, like living their own life. They like their own rules. They can get whatever they need by stealing it or anything like that. They don't want to go to school. They don't want to work. They don't want to submit under somebody because they've already become a, a young adult. Even at the age of five, they can be a little adult running around and they know how to protect themselves. Little girls will dress up as boys because they, they know it protects them. Like they learn, they learn to be very, very hard and callous. So for me, it, I, it's my heart to take in a street child someday, but it's a whole nother ministry. It's a whole nother ministry. Right now, as it stands, uh, American citizens cannot adopt from Cambodia. It used to be they could, but the U.S. State Department put a stop to that. And the reason they did that is because of perceived abuses within the adoption program. They found out there's some corruption in the system, 
There were some stories about uh, children who maybe weren't actual orphans that people were putting them forward to get adopted so that money could be made off of it. If we can't get them adopted to beautiful families in the United States or Canada or other countries, then what we do is we try to uh, love them right where they're at, try to bring family to them, and step into the shoes of their missing parents and come to the rescue. Obviously, it would be great for every kid to be able to go to the States, right? Because there's lots of opportunities. But with doing foster care and orphan care here in country, what you're helping to do is build the next generation of people within the country. And so if you look at the long-term impact that that can have on a country, it's pretty powerful to see that. 80% of the kids within two years of emancipation from an orphanage have been swallowed up by the streets. That means the girls are prostitutes, the, the kids are on drugs, they're in prison, or they're dead. And why is that? Because the state provides for their needs up until a certain point, and then they get put out. And what do they do when they go out there? You don't have anyone that cares about you. You don't have anyone to show you a way to go in life. You don't have any skills. Well, there's some people that are hovering out there on the edge of society that I have an answer for you. Uh, you come into the brothel or you start peddling drugs or something like that. And so what we want to do is be Jesus to these people, not just when they're kids. You know, God's love doesn't stop for someone just when they're a cute little kid. And so we want to help them transition into life. Rin Yam, the co-director of Water of Life, has a story that is all too common in Cambodia. When Rin was born, his father abandoned his mother and four older siblings. Unable to pay their rent, they were forced to live on the streets and struggled to earn enough money for food. He was orphaned at the age of eight when his mother died. He began sleeping here at the stadium, a popular place for the homeless, gangs, and drug dealers in the city. And then when I was eight years old, my uh, sister ran away from home because uh, some of my relatives had looked down and uh, spoke badly to my family. And then my mom just went around to find my sister. But she couldn't find my sister. She just kept drinking and smoking a cigarette. And one night, she ate the medicine to kill herself. That time, when, I, but when my mom came back home and uh, slept in the early night, you know, I keep calling my, my mom, Mom, wake up, wake up, Mom. But my mom couldn't wake up. And when I know that my, my mom passed away, I just lost hope. I don't know what to do. I cry. I said, I want my mom back. But my mom never came back. I didn't know what to do. I didn't know where to go. And later on, one of my aunties in law took me to stay with her for a while. But unfortunately, some of her children dislike me. My body put a lot of beaten, no? put a lot of juice, like my ear, like that, you know, and the, the shoe, the broom, the mop, and everything over my head. And sometimes, even I opened the, the door for them without smiling, they hit my face too. I, I never fear what is happiness in my life. Mostly I got beaten. And then later on I became a very bad boy. I start to run away from home. I uh, start to do a lot of bad stuff. And I uh, ran away from home because uh, some of her children uh, beat me a lot and I didn't know what to do. And I just ran away from home. Mostly I sleep here at the stadium. This is my home. I cheat people, I almost got to jail two times, and uh, stealing, and uh, did a lot of bad stuff. And the stadium was a dark place. You know, if I didn't have Jesus, I might die by HIV over here, or by disease, or by the accident, or by the star starvation. One day at the age of 16, Rin met Daryl, an American missionary who was walking around the stadium. Rin pleaded for his help, and eventually Daryl took Rin to the Cambodian Christian Arts Ministry. This opportunity changed Rin's life. I learned music, drama, singing, dancing, and especially the Bible. Because I love music, I love art, you know, I don't know. But I, I didn't, didn't know anything about art, you know. And then he put me to, in the art school, I'm so, I'm so excited. Yes, I want to learn, you know. But at, in the beginning, I didn't know anything. Two years, the Lord just draw me close to Him by reading His Word. And first, at first, He wants to change what is inside of me. You know, and He wants me to know who Jesus is. And one day, one of my teachers, my spiritual mom, I call them, 
they taught me about hell and heaven. The Holy Spirit really convicts my heart. I cry out. I said, no, Lord, I don't want to go to hell. I want to go to heaven with you. And then, suddenly, you know, like, I, I feel with God's Holy Spirit. And then, since then, God grew me very fast with all education. I found one gift the other, and after the other gift. Rin left the art school after living there for nearly 10 years. He was now an accomplished flute and piano player in addition to singing and dancing. He continued to pursue his art and was given an exhibition for his drawings. But after this, Rin struggled to find work and was tempted to give up. Until one afternoon, while sitting in an internet cafe, Rin felt compelled to introduce himself to an American sitting nearby. His name was Randy Fleming. Rin had said to me he had a dream to start a music school. And I said, okay, Rin, that would be fine. Uh, I would help you do that because I like to help people do things and give it to them. I said, I could help you do that. And he drove me to this side of town and he said, there's a building for rent. And at that time I was paying like $300 or something. I can't remember, but it was a small amount for renting my pastor's house. But Rin said, would we rent this building? And it was $1,000 a month. And he goes, brother, I just believe that God would do something like this and we could start a music school. Well, I said, Rin, I don't have the faith, but I'll do it on your faith. So uh, we rented the house and we thought we would take a few boys and help them. And Rin would help them learn music and I would just do the Bible with them, read the Bible each night with them. So we thought maybe 10 or 15 boys would be good and just study with them and help them through and get them skills. And I watched Mother Teresa and I really liked the movie about her life and I'd seen on Nacho Libre <laughs> and at the same time and they had a big impact on my life. So when I put him and Mother Teresa together, I thought, oh, there is the seriousness of Jesus with the, the, the joy of, you know, doing something fun with the kids. Do you love, Do you love my Jesus? So Randy and Ren started their house for boys. At first they had just two teenagers, Rit and Long. But the house quickly grew, and now only five and a half years later, has 50 boys and two other offshoots, Children of Hope and Holly's House for Girls. Rin's dream of running a school for orphans has come true, and he now gets to teach and disciple Cambodia's youth full time. I didn't ever want this to be my house. I wanted this actually to be Rin's house one day. I didn't ever think that we would have Water of Life as our own house. I thought it would be Rin's project. But then Rin and I are so connected now, we were doing it together, but I really wanted to give Rin the project so that he would take and run with it. And he is running with it, but I don't want it myself. I don't want to own or do anything because I have to think too much. I have to stay awake at night. If these are all my projects, I have to stay awake and think about how to deal with them all and how to run them all and how to get the kids up on time and get off to the project. But if the project belongs to them, they will think through all that and they'll go through all the discipline issues and they'll go through all the, the issues that would come up in trying to run a project. So it helps me in that I don't have to be so industrious. I can still sleep sometimes. <laughs> as for the first two boys taken in by Randy, Long is now known as Pastor Long and preaches every Sunday. He also has a degree in agriculture and works full time at a fish hatchery. And Rit is now finishing his degree in English and teaches several classes a week. He also leads outreaches to the villages every weekend. The Khmer people of the Angkor Empire were originally Hindus. The famous Angkor Wat was built as a temple to the Hindu god Vishnu in the early 12th century AD. But Theravadist Buddhism became the state religion in the 13th century. Admittedly, Cambodians see themselves as farmers and laborers. But this thought goes back much further than Pol Pot. It was the predominant thinking dating back to King Jayavarman II, who ruled the Angkor Empire in the 9th century. Cambodians have always been taught that they served at the pleasure of their king. That meant that they lived, worked, and died at his command. The poor farmers toiled their whole lives in the fields to produce rice, the wealth of the kingdom, which was confiscated at tax time. The kings of Angkor were brutal and unforgiving, taking all of the food, the young women for their large harems, and sometimes even practicing cannibalism when they ate men's gallbladders to absorb their power, a practice that persists in modern times. It's possible that Buddhism caught on because its principles of contentedness and karma helped to reinforce their traditional culture of helplessness. Mm -hmm. 
Ritz Sang, although not an orphan, was the first boy to come live with Randy. He invited us to travel with him to his family's home in Takeo Province. On the way, we stopped at Mount Chisor, a major Buddhist temple in Cambodia. On the way up the mountain, one of the boys named Vinak stopped to talk to this beggar sitting beside a shrine. He put his arm around him, an uncommon show of affection, and told him about Jesus and that he didn't have to make sacrifices and pray to the spirits. This boldness is typical of the youth living at Water of Life. Uh, we right now we on the top of Mount Jiso, and it's like uh, this is like um, 138 meters from the bottom. And this temple was built during a French colony, like 1907. Um, like uh, people came here to worship. But I was born in India and in the, the royal family. He, after he got enlightenment, yeah. he can see uh, thousands like life that he had before. So it's like it takes long years, like many lives, like thousands of lives for him to become a Buddha. They believe that um, what they do or what they get, they believe on what they have done in the past, uh -huh. in the past life. So for example, even they get suffer, it means like they had done something, something bad in the past life. If they become a rich or becomes like the, um, the king or the leader of a country, that means they have done something good in the past life. This is karma. That's karma, stop a karma, yeah. yeah. The Buddha died, they go to Nirvana. And Nirvana means like you have no suffering, you have no you have nothing. So it means everything is done, finished. You know, he believes that it's like people suffer because of their their thought and their mind. Like you know, being jealous, being like one this desire bad. And the thing is he tried to get rid of desire that people have. So if you wanna follow Buddha, you try to do your best to make your desire go down like zero. Uh, when they give the sacrifice to uh, the, the, the spirits, they believe that the, all the offering that they sacrifice is sent to their um, parents, their ancestors. For example, they, they send a chicken, even, and they believe that when a monk pray, the monk send all their chickens to the, the ancestors. They give the offering in case their parents are in hell. And the offering is go to hell to feed their ancestors. Hmm. There are a lot of people that they come here and in order to uh, give the offerings to um, their ancestors. And especially during Chumban, you know, uh, Cambodian people, they believe that in for 15 days, like the door of the hell open and all the spirit, the evil spirit in hell are released to the earth. They have to go to different pagodas, at least seven pagodas, seven Buddhist temples to give the offering. Because if you don't give the offering to them and when the ancestor come to the earth and find two different pagodas and do not find their food, they're gonna curse you. When they accept Jesus, often we see families uh, becoming more prosperous because they stop sacrificing their animals to Buddha. They buy the best food, the really expensive food, and they give it to the Buddhists. And with the healthcare also, they look down on people who are sick. They think it's because they are so mean to them because they think it's because of their past sin. That's the reason they are sick. We made a stop at the home of Vinak's grandmother to deliver some food for his young cousins. Fruit is a luxury in this area, usually bought as a sacrifice to the spirits. 37% of Cambodia's children suffer from chronic malnutrition, and the kids in this area are no exception. One of the things that I noticed is that some of the kids here are very small. Yeah, they're, they're very undersized. Is that because they, they, they... They're very small because they don't have um, uh, enough food to eat. The thing is, they eat only rice. And rice with the food, they don't have good food, you know. Yeah. They eat rice with soup, and the soup is just like water with some herbs. They are not healthy. Um, they lack vitamins. They lack protein. Some of the children are very short because they have lacked nutrition and often they have a problem with their brain. Sometimes their parent or their mum makes them take drugs to, so that they do not like, need to eat so much food. They're, they're very susceptible to every cold and every flu and everything. And because everything's so dirty, they cannot build up enough immune system to fight anything else off. And so when we take them to the doctor, they're so used to kids being so ill that it's just normal. Oh, that's fine. They're going to be okay. My name is uh, Red or Red Sang. And um, I'm now I'm working um, at Water of Life. 
my family. So I have seven members, my parents and my two brothers and my two sisters. We did a lot of things here, those, like doing farming with rice. And also we raised some few pigs, we raised some chickens, some ducks. Most of the time in, uh, the, that I spent, like that I did is like I spent with uh, a rice, like rice field doing farming. Yeah. So this is the house I told you. We made a most of it. Wow. <laughs> so to see the whole house, most of the things like made of palm mm. tree. So the leaves, so the leaves of the palm tree, and okay. bamboos, and this, that, you know. Cricket. Made crickets? Yes. <laughs> what do you this is no idea of farmers they do it now. And now they start to lay eggs and we put all this in order to keep eggs. And you know if we like if you sell eggs, one 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 plate of one bowl of eggs uh one dollar, one buck. Okay. So if you got like hundreds, I mean hundred bucks. Huh? Ten thousand reels. Ten thousand? Yeah, ten thousand. Oh, even oh, so more. Two dollars and two lands and things like that. Yeah. But I don't know if it's gonna work or not. <laughs> oh, so you haven't sold any yet? We haven't. We just started like last month. Oh. Yes. Mm. So, do you think it's gonna work? Um, I don't know. I don't know. See. But one day when I was in um, grade 11, I have to move from my, uh, my house and I live in, first I live in Pagoda, in a Buddhist temple. Because the Buddhist temple there is very close to my school, I became really sick. Because I tried, I studied so hard and like um, I had a headache so bad. And then I decided to stop studying for one year. For one year, every single day, I had a headache so bad in my brain. One day, it's like the, there is a team, like um, Randy's team, that they came to the church close to my uh, close to my school, when he talked to me and what he said, oh, you have a very good smile. And that was, like, really encouraged me a lot, you know. I have my mom and parents to care for me, but it's, you know, it's like, I live with them all the time, like, they care, but it's like, I feel still lonely, you know. But when they talk, when they told me, it's just a simple word, but it's very touching my heart, encouraged me a lot. And then one day, um, there's a camp in, um, in a, near the beach, like near the beach, like a lot of youth, a lot of teenagers, they go there, they went there, and I went there too. It's really good. It's like I see the difference between my life and their lives, and um, it's how people change their life, and they share a lot of testimonies to me. I have learned so much from that camping, you know, within three days, and um, we worked hard, we studied, we worshiped and together, and um, the Lord really spoke to me during three days that I went there, and the last day, I. I, I feel with the Holy Spirit and I cry so hard and accept Jesus from that time. I pray so hard. I prayed it every day. Even I went to school, I was riding bicycle, this and that. I prayed very much, very hard, and I trust in the Lord. And you know, you know what? God healed me completely, without any medicine. It's not worse. It's not an accident, but it's God. What God did it. So my my sickness is gone completely. This is my dad. It's not me yet. And then I thank God very much that I got a scholarship from the government so that I can continue my study in college. And while I'm there, I, I have a scholarship, but I didn't have a place to stay and I didn't have food to eat. So and then I asked Randy, please, can you give me a place to live and food to eat? I didn't speak English and Randy didn't speak Khmer. It's very hard to communicate. But what we can do is like he gave me like Bible reading plan and a Bible and we started to read Bible every day. So by reading Bible, my life has like, started to change so much. I started to go to different orphanages. And you know, the first time I didn't know how to do, how to teach kids. And then he said, go, just do it. And then I did it. And right now I'm working at Water of Life as the English teacher. And also I got a part-time job to teach English at a school in order to get some money to support uh, my family, my sister and myself as well. Um, I, I graduated from college, one school and I'm doing another bachelor in another school, like English. When I finish that bachelor, I can be a teacher of English. God really blessed, blessed me through Water of Life and through a lot of people, and God really blessed me with my brother and sister, and God blessed me, it's like, even I have a poor family, but we really love the Lord, and the Lord really blessed us so much. We would do medical clinics out to the village, and I would bring over teams, and we'd do those clinics a lot, and at one of the clinics, I met Rit, and uh, he had come and he had a lot of uh, issues with his mental uh, brain problems. 
And he, at that time, we didn't know if it was brain tumors or whatever, but it turned out later that he thought too much. He was too smart. <laughs> that could be a problem. And he was living at that moment in a Buddhist temple because it was close to his school. But we realized he needed to take a break, and the doctor gave him some uh, advice and some help. I had told them, Rit, if you ever need help, I will be here for you. And I don't know why I said that, because I normally wouldn't say something like that. I don't think it's wise for a missionary to make promises that he wouldn't be able to fulfill. But I never really thought of myself as a missionary, so I could break that rule. And so I said, if you ever need something, boy, I just believe that God has a work in your life. And then some years later, I would be across town, on this side of town, still living with my pastor, and Long and Ritt would call me. And I could not speak Khmer very well, and they certainly could not speak English at all. And they were explaining to me in Khmer that they wanted me to help them. And I'm like, what does that mean? And they said, well, we're at your house right now, and we want to live here, and we want you to help us go to college. So when I left from this side of town to go to that side of town, God and I had a long discussion, and I had a lot of breaking to do inside. To, before I showed up at that gate, I had a lot of attitude changes that needed to be made in my own heart. And then when I showed up at that gate, I had to uh, be willing and able to take the next step. And as soon as I went through the gate, I was willing and able to take the next step. It's widely understood that Cambodia was devastated from the four-year rule of Pol Pot, the Khmer Rouge, and the ten-year occupation by Vietnam. But in stark contrast to city life, the farmers in the provinces lived the way they did a thousand years ago, with thatch roofs and improvised farm tools. Electric service and indoor plumbing are many years from being a reality in the provinces. Typically, Cambodians resist change, and that includes modern farming techniques. They have no irrigation or any way to use it, and so they have the lowest rice yield of Southeast Asia. Since their economy is driven by rice production, widespread poverty is assured in the provinces, particularly in drought years. And I'm very encouraged because now the boys and girls not only study the word, but they go out and they do like their own projects. And, and this was not my idea. I just would go out and do the projects and take the boys with me sometimes. And then they started asking me, could they do their own projects? They'd say, Dad, Dad, or Grandpa, Grandpa, do you mind if we go to that village or that village? And I'd say, do you need something from me? And they go, just your love and just the fact that you're behind us. I go, well, uh, I can give you that, you know? I can do that for you. So they would start these projects in these villages, and as you've seen already, they would grow from like a few kids to hundreds of kids. I don't think of these things for them, but they think of them themselves, and they go out and they do them. This is a part of the world where the knowledge of Jesus is largely unknown. And so what we're doing is trying to um, not only help people with their practical needs, but equip pastors to reach their own people. At Harvest Bible College, we have two main groups that uh, take advantage of our school. The first group is uh, what we call the Phnom Penh group. Phnom Penh is the capital of Cambodia, and that's the city. So the people that we draw into Harvest in the city tend to be more educated. Uh, they can speak some English, they have some, uh, some school under their belt and some knowledge of the word. Sam Nang, a member of Water of Life, leads weekly trips to the provinces. Though not adopted by Randy, he considers him his spiritual father and uses Fleming for his last name. After stopping to pick up some food supplies, we took a five-hour van ride east to Svai Ring, a sparsely populated area very near to the Vietnam border. The second group of people uh, are the village pastors. And when what we discovered with the pastors in the village is their uh, education level is just super low. We met a whole group of pastors um, on the border with Vietnam and Svai province, also Prey Vang province. And when we met these guys, we could tell these guys love Jesus. But as Randy uh, explained to me, John, these, their knowledge of the word is so slight that a lot of times these pastors just keep repeating the same sermon over and over again. These guys are almost all bivocational. It means they're tuk-tuk drivers, you know, like taxi drivers for Cambodia. It means they are rice farmers and other things like that. Uh, every month we go out to the village. Several hours we'll have these day-long conferences, which will be an in-depth, uh, inductive Bible study methods, really trying to ground these guys in the essential doctrines. No 
matter how far we are separated from each other we serve one shepherd we're all underneath one shepherd and his voice is not hard to discern um, it's the voice of love it's the voice of grace and I and whenever I go there I don't want them to look at me and, and say um, you know this is an American pastor he is you know uh, uh, maybe uh, above us in some degree you know uh, we're all on the same we're all on the same uh, plateau that I think it's important for them to understand that you know and, and it's it's a theme that needs to be said over and over and over again that we have the same shepherd we can all hear the same voice from God and, and his name is Jesus and um, there's no um, there's no levels of, of, of Christianity you know and, and, and I, that's why I go there and I you know we're one family one God one father you know one Savior one Holy Spirit one church and um, we're all underneath that one shepherd no matter what language we speak yeah. we can still hear the voice of Jesus so the, it's the voice of love that we run to I think that's a message that they just need to hear over and over again so that they can be empowered uh, to grow that they can be um, something you know they, they can do better in their lives than maybe just working a rice field or you know there there is hope um, you can further yourself there, there's more experience to life than than just thinking that you're set in this um, uh, culture and there's no way out Pastor Chan Sedan is the senior pastor in this community today seven pastors from the surrounding area joined together to hear teaching from the visiting Americans they traveled about eight kilometers or five miles by bicycle or motor scooter to join together here. It's not easy for the, 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 to be the, the pastor to be the Christian pastor. So, but he he want to try. He want to correct all the pastor. Like you know, right now he he have all the pastor have his joy. You know, he know the Bible is clearly. You know, like he learn more from God. Like to, he read and then pray together. Like, <laughs> like he very thank God for blessing. Like supply. You know, like food. Like. Or, or like bring from your team, like through the team from the U.S. So thank you for God for for all the blessing from God. Like even it's small gift, but it's so important in first cry. You know, like it's so important for them because they need fruit. He said like all oh, the Christian, most of them is full family. The full family is come like Christian. It's so difficult for them. Like his their situation is hard. Like it's so difficult for them. So they not easy for find the food. You know, it's not easy for like find the food enough for them. You know, like sometimes they don't have food. One of the things that we do is um, we'll pay for the gasoline that they need to get there, riding their scooters, uh, and then provide them lunch. So. Recently, we had a conference in Svaidin province. We got an email back from uh, our team members in Cambodia, and they said, in order for us to host this uh, conference for 37 pastors, we're going to need to give them $150 for food and gasoline for everybody. $150 is all it took to train 37 pastors. Jesus said, to those who much has been given, much is required. Hun Sen, the Prime Minister from the Communist People's Party, has led the country since 1985. He was put in power by the withdrawing Vietnamese and claims that the economy is a free market. Though cronyism and anarchy are much more accurate terms. Though he has been given huge sums of foreign aid money over the years, he continues to make poor use of it by allowing as much as 50% of the country's income to be lost to insider corruption. While Hun Sen has worked hard to consolidate his power, he has introduced certain laws that make the work of missionaries much easier. For instance, there is a law that permits freedom of religion in the country, as long as you don't overtly criticize Buddhism or the government. The Cambodian government is eager to hand over social responsibilities to openly practicing Christians because it removes burdens like orphan care from its budget. 
World Orphans, based out of Castle Rock, Colorado, is another member of the close-knit and cooperative Christian community in Cambodia. We met Jesse Blaine, their country director, who invited us to come along with Pastor Hung Rot to a pastor's conference in Kampong, Chenang province. We just met together with a group of pastors and uh, the goal was to encourage them as they're having a few issues in the community, um, but it was a great morning, all morning meeting. Sometimes it's difficult for pastors out here to get education and training with the Bible. And so the main purpose, uh, besides encouraging them in their faith, was to work through a way to help them learn how to do inductive Bible study, which gives them the tools to be able to study and teach the scriptures on their own. Well, the beauty of inductive Bible study is that um, it's basically um, allowing the Word of God to interpret the Word of God. And it's important to teach them to draw their answers from the Bible. So if they're teaching in John chapter 10, um, you should be able to go to other shepherd passages in the scripture and allow the scriptures to interpret itself. You know, go to Ezekiel and find that, you know, woe to the shepherds who feed themselves and not the flock, you know. And, and they need to um, understand that the Bible is fully capable of interpreting itself. There's a report called The Portrait of the Church in Cambodia, which has guesses. It's really impossible to know final figures, but their guess is that something like 10% of pastors in Cambodia don't read the Bible, and 1% don't own a Bible, which is crazy. They're pastors. But uh, Pastor Hung, who we hung out with, or Hong, as they would say in Vietnamese, um, he's in the Bible morning and night. He's working through the Calvary Chapel inductive Bible study method and just goes into it. And part of his goal is to really pass on that desire and love for getting into scripture to other pastors. So the biggest point and reason that we went up to Kampong Chenang, which is a province about an hour and a half north, was to work with uh, pastors that Pastor Hung is friends with and encourage them um, in the midst of some of their, their troubles and issues that they were having. And rather than offer them a lot of point-by-point -point solutions, he just kept pointing them to Scripture and pointing them to Scripture and telling them how he tries to get through Scripture once a year, which for a Cambodian to read through the whole Bible uh, once in a whole year, right? Um, it's a lot for an American, but for a Cambodian that is in the province that doesn't have as much education, that's a, a real undertaking. So as you can tell that there's a lot of people that really love the Lord here because they're not uh, many of them continue to love the Lord despite their conditions and despite the uh, pushback from society and their culture. And so it has a way of purifying people very quickly. Yeah. So one example of that is this morning we just had a whole morning of Bible teaching and when they finished they said, is that all? They wanted to know more and more, uh, even though today is a work day when they could go earn money. A big value here is harmony. And so appeasing the spirits and being in harmony, that's the number one value. Um, not, not, nece right. not necessarily individual rights, but the harmony of the group. That's what's important. And so if you have this group of people that aren't appeasing spirits and aren't trying to stay in harmony because they're going in with a different religion, it's hard for them to accept. They just It's not within their framework for thinking about the world. They don't like to confront each other. They don't often confront each other. They don't go close to that line. Um, whereas in the States, we'd be more ready to confront people. Um, but here, once you cross that line, it's, you can never go back, oftentimes. So if you confront a police chief, that's it. He's going he's gonna to retaliate in some way. And here, here in uh, Cambodia, another issue is that you have two different types of populations of people. One is the traditional Cambodian or Khmer people, and one is the Vietnamese people. And Hung has the opportunity, because he's half Vietnamese, to be able to speak Khmer and Vietnamese. He has a desire to see the two churches work together to reach their perspective, respective communities together. Uh, especially to the uh, community of Vietnamese living along the banks of the Phong Lai Sa River and Lake. During the Vietnam War, tens of thousands of refugees fled across the border. When the Khmer Rouge took over, they closed the border, trapping all the Vietnamese inside Cambodia. 
When the borders were reopened, they weren't allowed to return to Vietnam without proper identification. Now their numbers have swelled to half a million people who are denied entry to their homeland or the ability to take up permanent residence here. These people are among the poorest and least educated in the country. The boats are the boat river. They are Vietnam church. Really? Yes. One go there but don't have time. Yeah. Uh, on the river, 300 kilometers, half, um, half million Vietnam we stay half on the river. Half a million people? Yeah. Five. Half on the water? Million, yeah, on the water. Wow. On a Phnom Penh to Siem Reap. Living on the river exposes them to numerous health problems, but dysentery, malaria, and dengue fever spread by mosquitoes are most common. Nearly in tears, Hong told us that he had to stop helping the Vietnamese because he cannot afford the time or money for gas to visit them anymore. At their church they have a school which uh, reaches out mostly to Vietnamese kids. They do half Vietnamese and half Khmer. Um, charges a dollar a month. <laughs> For their, for their tuition, and then ends up subsidizing 70% of the students' tuition. But it's, he uses it as an outreach because a lot of these kids are from families that would never come to church. So as part of the uh, school, they, they share the gospel with the kids. And then he runs a church. He's got six kids. He has a van that he drives for occasional teams that will pay him money. Um, and I'm sure there's three other things that I can't remember right now, but. Yeah, he's a really dynamic guy that's doing a lot. Well, where are we right now? Uh, in the my church here. Yeah? Yes. And, and what happens in the front? Uh, for school. And uh, my school. How many students do you have? One, 97, 97 students I have. Monday to Friday. Have to study Vietnamese, Cambodia, English. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I have three languages in here. And what is your name? My name is Charlie. Charlie. Yeah, you call me Charlie. Charlie. <laughs> Charlie. Ken Ye is one of Hong's six children and is part of the team of teachers led by Hong's wife. This school provides a safe place for the neighborhood children to play and study in the mornings. It is likely that the majority of these children's parents have no more than a third grade education. Yet these kids will be trilingual with Khmer, Vietnamese, and English giving them the opportunity to break the cycle of incredible poverty that they were born into. Uh, children come here, learn. Yeah. Uh, morning, here, afternoon government. Oh. Yeah. But first time for uh, learn for students, yeah. Christian, about yeah. Bibles. Hey, Susan! Yeah. I want to tell you about one missionary uh, on our team. His name's Andrew. Andrew is a guy 22 years old from Austin, Texas. Had a job trying to figure out what he really wanted to do in his life. Came on this trip with us never expecting that at the end of the trip he would feel a call of the Lord to come over here permanently. And so he went back to uh, Austin, sold his car, quit his job, came back over here as a missionary. And you know he's a great, he's a self-starter. He didn't go and try to find who he could help. He started his own things. Uh, he also started a ministry out in, at the dump. There's a village out by the old city dump. These people are so poor that what they do is they go and uh, pilfer amongst the trash trying to find the little plastic bottles or some recyclable, something that they can eke out uh, a meager existence. Andrew is a uh, very interesting kid. Um, I, I had the honor and the, the, the privilege of uh, being his roommate on my first trip in April of 2012 with, the, with Andrew. And it wasn't too long into our conversations that I realized that this was not a man of the world. This was not a man who was uh, deeply immersed like myself growing up in the Bronx and, uh, and uh, seeing all the things and doing all the things that I've done. Uh, I was a very worldly man. Oh, I can see why you love it here, bro. Mommy. Here? Yeah. What's your name? I instantly call him Saint Saint Andrew. Um, just watching those kids jump all over him, and here he is walking into a into a basically a hut for a church, and he has to bend down to 
go into the doorway because he's, he's so much toy. Yeah, he's a big guy. Yeah. And um, but I was so encouraged to to see a man. I think he's 22 years old. Uh, just to see a man just say, you know what? I'm leaving everything in Texas. He comes from a wealthy family, and just to see him say, I'm I'm going to leave this. Whether it's forever, I don't know. But even just for the time, just sharing sharing the love of God with people that are in a dump and. It's just, it's just, it's just marvelous to watch. I'm here six times a week. At the dump. At, at the dump. Yeah. Uh, two, um, two times on Monday, one in the afternoon, one at nighttime. Mm-hmm. I bring food. I teach them English. Teach them the Bible. Um, I do small, small outgoings to people's families, uh, children's families, to to tell them about Christ and to share mm-hmm. God's love, mm-hmm. um, counseling, um, just kind of. Fixing people's problems, mm-hmm. helping them with their problems. I grew up in a, a great family, Christian, almost my entire life. I was homeschooled, uh, live on 108 acres, just have a great family and wonderful siblings. and. Actually, standing on part of the dump. Mm-hmm. This whole city is built on part of a dump, and it's the retired dump. And uh, it used to be a lot of the family's income to shift through all the trash, and they shut down the dump and they buried it over there. Um, over that, that big mound. And, um, and it's a, lot, a lot of the families lost a lot of jobs, and uh, they just pick through everything they can recycle and they sell that. And what kind of an income would they get from that? Uh, maybe a uh, Maybe a dollar a day or 50 cents, maybe. Now they're just kind of piling on debt. They're trying to stay alive because they don't have jobs. And the people who live here, they have to pay rent for this property? Yes, uh, someone's bought it all. Some major corporations bought it all. Uh, they have a, very much have lots of diseases, very rampant like HIV. Um, jobs are very scarce because they don't really know how to do anything. Mm-hmm. What they can really do is just uh, sell themselves or uh, sell drugs or panhandle or shift through the, the rising trash from the buried dump. So this is the school that the government set up um, and every single time they pass they go between grades or have tests they have to pay the teacher in order to pass it or else the teacher fails them. So if you don't have very much money or you don't have any money, you pretty much stay in first grade or don't stop going to school. Most kids here, um, if they go to a public school, end up having to bribe their teachers to be able to make it through exams. It's not a matter of just knowing the material. It's a matter of bribing or paying your way. And um, because a lot of time, and then if you look at that system, a lot of t- times teachers really don't make enough here. And so they are doing whatever they can within the culture to be able to make enough. So a lot of parents don't have the value for education because their education system was wiped out. And so why would they push the kids that they're taking care of to have education? And so you have a destruction of nuclear family, destruction of those values, destruction of the value of education. And then you have where we are now, where they're moving really quickly and trying to develop very quickly, but it's not built on a really strong foundation just yet. They had a fight for I noticed that no one has any um, protective equipment like gloves or shoes. And and no one's entitled to to supply those to them because no one is contracted to work for them. They just come and show up and do the work and they get paid for the labor. So if they don't like the conditions, they can just leave. Out in this house, there's about there's mm-hmm. six rooms. Mm-hmm. No, three rooms. Yeah, one, two, three, yeah, six rooms. And there's probably about 20 families. Mm-hmm. And they live right next to the recycling building that I just showed. Mm-hmm.
when I first came here, it's here partic particularly at the dump, it kind of shocked me. It seemed like they were just getting by and there, there was no hope in their life. And not even the very thing they believed in, which was is Buddhism, even saves them and actually condemns them because they don't have enough money to give to Buddhism. And I asked Tree of Life if I could use their building. And they graciously allowed me to use it. And I started teaching six classes a week, one child at a time, one person at a time. I've seen lots of fruit and their lives being changed by that. After returning from Cambodia, it was difficult to reintegrate with American society. It made me look at everyday things, like a drive through town or a trip to the grocery store in a new light. I realized just how blessed our country is while simultaneously being so unhappy. Suicide is now the leading cause of injury death for Americans, and one third of the nation suffers chronically debilitating stress. These stats are confusing, because unlike rural Cambodians who have survived genocide and struggled to find enough to eat, our biggest problem is managing our excess. Our culture tells us that status and material possessions will give us the fulfillment we seek. But in the end, no amount of gourmet coffee, electronics, cars, designer handbags, or social status is going to make you happy. Whether you are a Christian, a Hindu, a Buddhist, or an atheist, it is kindness and love that ultimately uplifts the human spirit. I, I think a lot of Americans go to the third world thinking, what can I bring to them? But what I really learned through shooting this film and interviewing is that, no, what can they give me? Uh, I can give them resources and I can go and I can encourage them, but I, they have the context. Because here, a lot of the times, we haven't struggled. You know, maybe you have student loan debt. Um, you know, maybe you, maybe you have mortgage debt that's, that's overbearing, but they don't have food half the time. Um, you know, we saw kids that were 10 years old and they were just feet shorter than, than kids here in America because all they have is rice soup to eat. Even the people in America who suffer, and there are those who suffer, they're not suffering the same way. Even they, they don't have like the food, but they have the Jesus Christ. Like, the Jesus blood, like the Holy Spirit, or the blood, you know, like give them the new life from, from God, you know, like change their life. Even like they, it's not easy for them to like, live, on, live on the ground, live on the earth, right? But when, when they believe God, like they are so have joy, like, so have joy. Man. So I don't know what God has for the future. I think tomorrow I could be working at Walmart in America as a greeter. And I could not complain because what he's allowed me to see and what he's allowed me to touch and the lives he's allowed me to be a part of here, well, how could I trade that for a retirement? And I'm glad that people in America work and they have retirements and they, they have cars and things like that because that's how God's planned for their life, perhaps. But for me, he planned it differently for my life. Uh, every single uh, American has the ability to save somebody's life or transform somebody's life. There's an old saying, in the world you may be just one person, but to one person you may just be the world. This uh, model that so many American believers have bought into of chasing the American dream, that is a false and cheap counterfeit. But I encourage people to step out because you don't want to get to the end of your life, be on your deathbed and look back on your life and have any regrets. You know, Wish that you'd taken more chances, You know, that you could have had a life that really was a life of faith and love uh, but you were too conservative and too careful and you missed out on an opportunity. Don't let that happen. Having money, a good job, or owning high quality products is not a bad thing. The world needs success and wealth to grow industry. Charities wouldn't even exist without support. What it comes down to is our perspective. We as human beings need to understand that eventually the things we buy will turn to dust. But your actions towards others will live on, causing ripples around the world. Those chains that the world or that sin has put on them. And God frees them. They live in that freedom. In America, the kids, maybe they forget. It's been given to them so much, and it's, it's makes, we make it so easy for them. They don't know. Here, when you give them real freedom, it so contrasts to the chains that when they experience freedom, they want to live in it, and not only live in it, as you've seen, they want to tell all their friends about it. So what is the secret to reshaping a broken society? What can succeed where the United Nations and other world powers have failed, even after spending tens of billions of dollars in foreign aid? It comes back to love and kindness, shifting focus away from governments and toward raising up leaders to unify a fractured society, working from the bottom up, helping one person at a time. 
what we want to do, and it's going to take a generation, I think, to shift this mentality. But what we're trying to help do is have Cambodians see Cambodians helping each other. We didn't expect this year we'd have 16 kids in college. I will say we did not expect that that would occur, that we put 16 boys and girls in college. But you give them education, you make them lawyers, you make them teachers, then you have your first non-corrupt judge. What a thing to do to a country, what a way to change a country. We go to college and like through that water of life can give us like education as well. So by having education, we, you know, we can make the society becomes better. We're not just alone, we together, we can change it. And God is in our, on our side, and through God we can do all things. I do remember that Mother Teresa wrote in her book, someone said to her, all you do is just a drop in the ocean, so why do you do it? She says, if I don't do it, that drop will never exist. So yes, there are organizations that do this way better than I do it, that do this way better than all of us do it, but we are just one more drop. But that drop exists, and it's here. I believe that God is going to uh, keep working. I believe this country, they're open. And so, whatever country is open, I'm here, and I, the people that are in Mongolia, the people that are in Africa, I believe that God wants to work in all these places. But I'm here, so I want to be that drop of water here. And I want to do that here. with Gus and we're having a little dilemma because <laughs> Gus will not eat something that he doesn't know what if it I is. If I can't identify it and if they can't even tell me what it is, different people. Lucky, what is this? You don't know? This one? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> what do I don't know. The break with, uh, with uh, mayonnaise. And, uh, That's meat? Go. Yes. Yeah. Kind of meat. Kind of meat? <laughs> it's a kind of meat. It's kind of meat. Sort of like kind of. Yeah. I'm sorry. That's like the, that. I'm going to have to skip on that one. It's just not good. How many steps did it take to get up here? Um, we have two ways. One way is that we just did it. It's 420 steps. And the other way is like 318 um, steps around that. So we made it. Like, so. Why we go the long way? Because we want to show that we're the man. <laughs> <laughs> Wow! You think I'm the oldest person in Cambodia, but uh, I'm probably not. Uh, I had a 92-year-old. Uh, okay, so <laughs> he probably looked better though. That's all I want to say. <laughs> he probably looked like a lot better, but that's okay. <laughs> And a one, and a two, and hit it. <laughs> They're gonna have to, you guys figure out which picture you want to be in. <laughs> Yo! Hey, Roller. It's the cutest thing, guys. <laughs> This is so awesome. We love you kids. I know you don't understand our language, but we love you so much. You kids are awesome.